It takes a certain type of male to achieve the ultimate fantasy. Sex on tap, whenever, with whoever, however, and even with whatever. Enter the dominant male. But there's a price to pay for all this sex. Macho males must rule as potent symbols of masculinity. They must endure exhausting sexual marathons and fight hard with rival males over everything from us to territory and still have enough energy to produce millions of healthy sperm throughout a life brutal and short. In the world of wild sex, there are serious strings attached and the life of the dominant male is definitely not for the feeble or faint-hearted. that relationships between male and female may be complex, even difficult, stretching tolerance to the limit. But in pure biological or evolutionary terms, their relationship is remarkably stable. At the micro level, the world of sperm and egg, these male and female sex cells never compete. They work together. This perfect balance exists because the male produces lots of small, expendable sex cells called sperm, while the female provides far fewer, but much bigger cells, her eggs. It's the perfect match. The problems start in trying to get sperm and egg together. In other words, sex. It triggers the war between the sexes, each gender pursuing genetically selfish ends, because natural selection favors only the winner. It's at this behavioral level where creatures interact through courtship, mating, and conception that spectacular conflicts break out. <laughs> Confrontations occur because males and females operate different sexual strategies. Females often have the opportunity to get hold of sperm from more than one male, allowing them to exercise a kind of quality control over who does the fertilizing and when. But we all know that where sex is concerned, males always like to come first. So the dominant male has evolved into a virile, sexy beast that uses brute force to fight off reproductive rivals and achieve sexual success. And he appears to stop at nothing to take what's rightfully his. The stakes don't come any higher. In the world of wild, primal sex, a male finds himself under enormous pressure to win the ultimate contest, survival of his genes. This film concentrates on the dominant male, on how he's become so powerful and why his aggression is tolerated by oppressed females and bullied subordinate males. Dominance tends to occur in social groups where females can regularly mate with more than one male. And there's one species where male and female promiscuity has created a specially fierce sperm competition. Our closest relative, the chimpanzee. They're human-like, playful, intelligent, and among the most sexually aggressive creatures on Earth. An adult male chip.
these marauding male alliances are an intimidating part of forest life, as they fight for dominance, kill not just for food, and if that wasn't enough, display their voracious sexual appetite. Chimps live in a man's world, societies dominated by fiercely territorial males who only seem to care about sex. This community contains around a hundred individuals. They all share a home range, but live in smaller groups that are ruled by strong males. Neighboring groups can become locked in violent conflict as rival dominant males mount hostile raids. This group is the nucleus of the 100 strong community, and as its spearhead, they're a defense against invasion. There's a hierarchy. A hierarchy tree is a single solitary chimp, an alpha male, aged in his mid twenties, chimp prime. Socially and sexually, he's reached his peak. The most common strategy for staying top chimp is intimidation. So the earliest sign of a challenge provokes a fearsome charging display. But if the threat comes from a neighboring group, the alpha male rallies his brotherhood for a coordinated cross-border raid. These brutal assaults can be bloody and even fatal, proving just how violently the male chimp expresses dominance. But this violence isn't only directed at other males. To us, female chimps look like nature's battered wives. And the male's idea of a good time looks more like oppression than sex. These impressive gestures are simply non-verbal ultimatums to the female that sex is what he wants and there's no way out of it. also uses subtler cues. This frantic branch waving indicates his immediate state of desire. But to guarantee he gets his point across, there's always the bristling coat and his impressive erection. Emphasis on visual signals has evolved because chimps have good eyesight and see their world in color. Perhaps adapting to life in the three-dimensional forest meant refining vision to help them hunt and communicate. Certainly the sexual language of the chimp has focused on visual clues to express their sexual arousal. This is not very subtle. To us, it's really off-putting. But to a male chimp with raging hormones, it's like a peek up the skirt. Sexual swelling gets a male chimp hot. It's the female's unmistakable way of advertising her urgent need for sex. Chimps pass on male and female roles through a kind of hands-on sex education. This open-minded approach obviously works. Juveniles really like to watch, scrutinizing the acting close-up, picking up a few tips, including the art of ejaculation in 10 quick thrusts. Unfortunately for her, not all chimp sex is quite as good as this. There's a downside to the sexually dominant male. This 
is his sister. Female chimps may be incredibly promiscuous, but even they draw the line at brothers. Unfortunately, no one told him. He appears too aroused to care, and after beating her into submission, forces her to have sex. And there's more to come. It's not just on the family level that chimps are sexually aggressive. The battle continues inside the female chimp. She's been penetrated by other males, and their sperm is now running a microscopic egg race. This is where things really begin to get aggressive, as the tunnel of love is transformed into a battleground. This is sperm warfare. These sperm are designed to fight as they support the alpha sperm, so that the whole ejaculate works like a micro-brotherhood, fighting its way to the egg. The sexual role for these kamikaze sperm is not to create life, but to block the opposition. Next on Wild Sex, we take a long, hard look at the genitals of some of nature's smallest sexy beasts. and the exhausting sex life of the lion. While some sperm become sexual weapons, the penis, that ultimate symbol of male virility, can be just as effective in the right hands. Nature's most impressive genitalia generally belong to the smaller life forms. Insects certainly seem to have cornered the market in the formidable penis department. Female promiscuity. It's not just pride that's at stake here. It's life and death. Genetic survival. But apart from monopolizing access to his mate, there are few ways for a male to eliminate the competition. So to guarantee their paternity 100%, males will do virtually anything to subvert or control female choice. Bedbugs clearly have the same unpleasant habits as most parasitic bloodsuckers inflating like bloody balloons on the flesh of their host. But they do even worse things to their own kind. Be thankful you're not a female bed bug. She's got a perfectly good set of sexual organs. In other words, a fully functioning genital tract. But he's after something a little more unusual. He's in possession of yet another awesome penis, which he wields like a sword. Up close, bedbug sex looks almost medieval. He stabs the sharp end right into a belly and ejaculates. There's a name for this kind of thing. It's called traumatic copulation, an accurate description. But the biological reasons for such a shocking sexual assault are really quite ingenious. By ejaculating his sperm directly into the female's bloodstream, the male bedbug guarantees 100% that he'll be the one to fertilize her eggs. However, don't try this at home. Fortunately, the female bedbug has a pad of tissue in her abdomen called the Berlis organ, which helps repair the damage caused by being stabbed in the stomach with a sharp penis. To make this method of insemination work, the female bedbug has also evolved a special storage gland. As sperm circulates through her bloodstream, it becomes lodged in this gland and is stored until she gets her next blood meal when she'll be ready to produce a batch of eggs. The 
Evolution has created traumatic copulation to avoid sperm competition. Sent directly into the bloodstream, sperm cannot be scooped out. It's unstoppable. Life can also be traumatic for male bedbugs. Watching Mr. Big as he's about to stick his penis into the little guy. And once he's ejaculated, his sperm will slowly but very surely migrate all the way to the smaller male's vastefferens, or sperm duct. So when the trauma's over and the injected mull, he'll actually be using some of his rapist sperm. This may be the ultimate tactic in sperm warfare. One male forcing another to carry out the chore of insemination. But there's a lot more to being a dominant male than just having a fancy penis. What about fatherhood and fulfilling a real parental role thing? We need to scale up to the larger, more conspicuous males of the animal world. You probably don't get much more male than this. The African savanna hosts a never-ending cycle of life and death. This has to be the ultimate testing ground for the uber male. Lions are at the top of many super leagues. Ace predator, biggest cat, no enemies. And they have an enormous sexual appetite. Over 150 times in just two fun-packed days. This prodigious sexual appetite is hardwired into the lion. In our book, they're clinical sex maniacs. And the reason they have to indulge in such relentless, almost mechanical, non-stop copulation is her fault. It takes a lot of sex to get a lioness pregnant. We're talking vigorous stimulation. It's been estimated that for every one lion that is born and makes it through his first year, it requires mum and dad to have had sex 3,000 times. If you ever wondered why male lions seem to spend so much time sleeping, perhaps this is the answer. For Mr. Lion, there's a great deal at stake. He needs to perform well. The pride rely on him to sire the next generation. This pride already has a dozen adult females and subordinate males, with several young cubs, all living under the rule of their powerful pride chief. A dominant eight-year-old male. Life is looking pretty good. But there's trouble brewing. This is a lone marauding male. He has no pride of his own. And at six years old, he's younger and stronger than the reigning head. He's just crossing into pride territory and heavily scent marked boundaries tell him what he's getting into. There's only one real threat to an adult male lion. They have no natural enemies, just other males. Warnings through scent and sound usually work to keep trespassers at bay. But when things do escalate into full conflict, the outcome is spectacular. nearly 500 kilos of male aggression in conflict here. It's all about power and strength. Finally, the older male backs down, leaving the territory never to return. His pride has taken a knock. 
that he's left alive. However, there's real bloodshed to come. The new ruling male now carries out the Herodian slaughter of the Pride's youngest cubs. If their mother intervenes, she may be critically injured or even killed. Their fate is inevitable. Killing these young cubs purges the pride of the old male's bloodline. The juvenile males may only escape death by leaving the pride up. Despite the change of leader, the remaining Pride members have all the benefits they enjoyed before, provided they recognize the dominance of the newcomer. Brutal as it may seem, by killing the cubs of the old male, the new male has pulled a remarkable biological trigger. No suckling cubs left, the females will become fertile again. And we all know what that means. It's a good job he didn't exhaust himself taking over the pride. This lion has now got three very horny lionesses to satisfy. And for the next few days, he's going to be having sex every 10 to 15 minutes, night and day, rain or shine. But it's not all wine and roses for her. His penis is barbed at the end so that it hurts her when he withdraws. Lionesses will often turn in anger on a dismounting male. But his gnarly member has to cause a sexual action to conceive. She also needs exactly the right kind of stimulation. Female lions don't release an egg until after they've mated. And it's thought that the pain caused by the male's heavily barbed penis stimulates to many the sexual extravagance of lions must be beneficial. And it's quite likely that the males are getting far more out of this situation than all the action they can handle. Perhaps the more energetically the females are stimulated, the less likely they are to start playing away. Which means the better lover you are, the more likely you are to father cubs. Still to come on Wild Sex, discover why this heavyweight macho male has been endowed with a five centimeter penis and find out what it takes to turn on an elephant seal. Infanticide is just another particularly violent form of sperm competition because it increases the killer's reproductive success and his chances of fathering offspring. This male reproductive strategy can be found in other stable social groups like that of the gorilla.
The most competitive sperm wars happen in species where the male's parental investment is just sperm. However, social stability leads to different sexual strategies and some alarming physical characteristics. Take the silverback gorilla, half a ton of prime dominant male, but equipped with just a five centimeter penis and rather small testicles. It's one of our familiar stereotypes, the overpumped muscle man, huge arms, massive chest, and a small penis. But for the male gorilla, having a tiny fat sense, despite what we see as his shortcomings, this, sexually speaking, very lucky. He's in total control of all these females. He's the only one who gets to have sex with them. And every other gorilla around here obeys him. He rules the group through intimidation. He may have tiny parts, but you'd be a fool to try and pinch one of his wives. But why does such an icon physical strength end up with a penis around the size of a human thumb. The fact is, gorillas are simply matching their supply to the demand. He can afford to economize on sperm and sperm production apparatus because he rules an incredibly stable social group. All the females belong to his harem. The cost of male sperm production is cheap compared to the female egg, but that doesn't mean it's entirely trivial. It still requires valuable physical and biological resources to keep a good supply on tap. And any male that can economize on his sexual apparatus, on sperm, penis, and testicles, will have plenty of energy left for building large muscles. Underpinning the male gorilla's dominance over the group is a strong, ritualized social system, a kind of wildlife mafia. One silverback lives in an extended family of females and their offspring, and in many cases, a number of closely related adult males. Such stability leaves the silverback free to pursue his main goal, to mate with as many females as possible, to increase his chances of reproductive success. The male gorilla may have a small penis, but he probably has the ultimate mating system. And gorilla sex drives are strong. On the fringes of many groups live males who have left because their mating chances are next to nothing. And it seems such outcast males are not uncommon around other rigidly controlled societies where dominant males defend their harems of females. However, while the silverback can depend on the strong ritual of guerrilla society to keep control, there are some harems where dominant males really are put through their paces. <laughs> The male elephant seal isn't everyone's idea of the perfect partner. He's fat, sleeps around, and forces himself on females. And they don't look like the most caring parents. However, the male elephant seal does manage to perform a crucial parental role of protection. 
the beach can be a dangerous place for a vulnerable young elephant seal, especially when the grown-ups are having sex. Once a year, elephant seals turn up on this beach to have a wild mating party. These bulls are full of pent-up sexual energy and it's about to get released. They haul themselves onto the beaches long before the females are due to arrive, about a month from now. Males must first establish territories which work like bachelor pads to attract females. These alpha males, or beach masters, are the biggest of all. And as the beach begins to fill up with prospective blubber lovers, decent territory space becomes scarce and testosterone levels begin to peak, provoking fearsome fights between competing males. Elephant seal bulls are awesome beasts, real heavyweights, over 3,000 kilos of aggressive, sexually eager male. It's thought that their skin alone weighs more than 100 kilos, lined with over 600 kilos of blubber, and that massive head, at nearly 50 kilos, weighs the same as his heart, which keeps everything moving, just about. Bull seals weigh twice as much as females. The massive difference has been shaped by their sexual strategy. The size of the female is determined purely by natural selection. In other words, environmental adaptations that have helped them eat more, grow faster and stay in shape. While the male's fine physique has been honed to perfection by a mixture of natural selection and sexual selection. For the male elephant seal, size really does matter. It's his strategy for success. Even as the females make their beachhead debut, the males are still preoccupied as they compete fiercely for territory. Those with established beach space must keep it protected against rival males on the lookout for a prime spot. This period of challenge and counter-challenge is a critical part of elephant seal courtship. It provides the females with crucial information for choosing their mates. The males are actually being closely scrutinized by a panel of choosy females. They need plenty of protection when there are so many eager males about. But each female is looking for more than safe sex from her protector. There's an even more urgent requirement. She's about to give birth. Before they have sex, the females will have last year's pups and they need a male around to make sure that they're left in peace. So he's really on a promise. By overseeing mother and pup through birth and suckling, he'll keep her around long enough to have sex. Her breeding strategy is called delayed implantation. The fertilized egg doesn't implant and begin to develop until the timing is right for the fetus to be born, just before the next mating season allowing for a lot of flexibility as far as mating goes and ensuring most babies are born within a few weeks of each other the following year. Females come back into heat 19 days after giving birth and will be receptive for about four days. And it's only then that the males approach her for sex.
throws a flipper over her side, rips her neck in his teeth, and begins copulation. Resistance by a female only results in the male moving his large and heavy body on top of her so that she's unable to move. Protecting and servicing these harems spreads the male elephant seal pretty thin. It's around the clock protection for weeks on end, during which they'll stop eating, just to try and keep control of their mating opportunities. This sexual strategy is called female defense polygamy. It ensures he'll benefit from the biological rewards of sex and fatherhood, but it's still a very tough and physically demanding life, requiring massive energy investment. They may be big and strong, but male elephant seals live considerably shorter than females. Elephant seals are extreme as far as mammals are concerned. Their mating strategy makes some males far more successful than others, purely because of their size and strength. But not all male elephant seals have the kind of physical presence to be a beach master. And as a consequence, some opportunistic males have developed an ingenious alternative strategy to sexual success. Despite the emphasis here on size and strength, there's still some room for the little guy to get lucky. These smaller males hang out along the edge of the rookery and try to mate when the harem master is asleep or busy. And sometimes they succeed. While sexual selection for the elephant seal is intense enough to create a massive difference in male-female size, such extremes can also create other strategies that rely less on brawn and more on opportunism. Not surprisingly, sneaky males have become familiar characters in societies where dominant males rule. What's in it for them? Well, they devote little time and effort to growing large enough to fight for a territory and don't invest hard-earned valuable energy. Instead of building muscle, they build sperm. And the cost of sperm is not trivial. By effectively parasitizing the dominant and territorial males, they also pass on the sneaker gene to future generations. In some species, the sneaker male can become as successful as his dominant peers. After the break, wild sex reveals why, despite his bravado, a macho male is outnumbered and outcast by a group of females. There is no single sexual strategy that's best. The most effective at the time depends largely on what your rival is doing. Sex strategies are a bit like a game of paper, scissors, stone. Nothing works every time. But the sneaker male has even managed to undermine the huge physical presence. few species, the sneaker may have the most effective sexual strategy of all. The Gelada baboon social system was once described as one male per group. They live in large troops, hundreds of individuals together occupying the high grasslands of Ethiopia.
But while each troop contains several females that associate with one dominant male, all is not what it seems. The dominant male looks like a harem master. At roughly twice the size of the female and sporting a large set of canine teeth for fighting, he finishes off the look with a spectacular flowing mane. He's an animal advertising his ability to inflict terrible bites during brutal struggles for dominance. Gelada does a lot of fighting, engaging in fierce battles with rival males, either to maintain or take over the harem. <laughs> However, research has shown that not all males take the macho approach to harem leadership. Instead, some establish long-term relationships with just one or two females. This might look like second best and the only option for a loser, but because these males never engage in violent fights, they live longer. So a submissive strategy could actually mean greater reproductive success throughout a peaceful life. As for natural balance, neither male strategy excludes the other. In fact, male geladas use both. But there's something the male gelada seems quite unaware of. Something that can ultimately threaten his sexual success. On the face of it, there's a simple contract between the male gelada and his harem. For as long as he's physically impressive and supports his harem, including protecting the young, he has exclusive mating rights. But the gelada may not be in total control of his destiny, because as soon as the females change their minds, he's in trouble. A ring of red beading develops on the naked patch of her chest and her vulva visibly swells, attracting the males. At this time, these females are the true sexual leaders of this group because they may choose... Regardless of who wins the contest for control of the troop, the females can chase any unwanted male out of his own territory by a combined show of physical force. So despite the male's larger size and greater strength, it's the gelada females that have the ultimate say in his reproductive success. Evolution of alternative reproductive strategies has helped many less impressive males to save on the high cost of conventional machismo. The fact is, while most females, among most species, will have sex and successfully reproduce, the majority of males will not. The dominant male exists because females need him. In human terms, the females of most species are shameless, lustful, and wanton. And most lustful males face a problem. Hundreds of peers with the same thing on their minds. Sex, the most powerful force in evolution.
we've seen that males compete for mates, sometimes violently, and that the winners of these bouts seem to then have complete control of the mating process. But the stereotypes of passive female and aggressive male only tell one side of the story. The male's strategy for increasing the number of offspring he fathers is a story of adaptation and counter-adaptation. Subordinate males and females are also strategists, highly competitive animals, and equally powerful influences on the evolution of wild sex.